And we finished up uh, kind of with this example of uh, number four for our strengthening mechanism. We don't use eraser. Uh, precipitate or particle strengthening. Slash particle strengthening. Um, so we saw, again, we found this critical radius, RC. So that distinguishes between when we're going to cut, when we're going to bow. Again, this is kind of the energy for cutting, the energy for bowing. So we saw that on this side, the energy for bowing is much, much higher here. So we are going to cut here, and we are going to bow on this side. Why are we cutting and bowing on this side? So as our particle size increases, here we have a huge particle. If we cut through this particle here, we're going to create a lot of surface area here, which is not good. So we do not uh, basically want, <laughs> we don't want to uh, create surface area that is always energetically unfavorable. Instead, as our particle size increases, we know that our curvature is proportional to one over the radius. So it's going to uh, the whole uh, the energetically unfavorable part of bowing is you have to create again you have to move that dislocation line around and kind of encircle your precipitate. But again, if you have a large particle, that kind of curvature, that tension you have to put on that dislocation line is going to be less. So we're going to bow at large particle sizes. So when R is less than RC. When we have small particle sizes here, small particles, you're not creating as much surface area, right? So that surface area contribution is small. But when your radius, your radius of curvature is small, when you have small particles, that bowing is really, really, really unfavorable here. So you're going to cut through the particles there. So I want to give you this one thought experiment. So look at scenario one and scenario two. So the only difference between scenario one and scenario two is that the volume fraction of my particles or precipitate in one is less than the volume fraction of my uh, volume fraction of my particles or precipitate in two. The average particle size, so in one and two are equal. So we're dealing with the same size of particle. So one and two, uh, I should use a subscript here. Ah. Erase. So the average particle size one and two is equal. So the only difference here is that if we draw these kind of squares, this kind of schematics, I'm going to do purple. So it's just right there. So the number of particles I have is different, the volume fraction. So here, if everything else is the same, I just have way more particles or precipitates in this scenario. So given this situation, how is our, what is, how will R critical, what is going to change, you know, I want the relationship between my RC of 1 versus my R critical of 2. What's going to change here? Well, let's think about it for a second. So the only thing that kind of uh, hurts us in terms of uh, cutting is that we need to create more surface area, right? Bowing, it all, it basically, it just is determined on, you know, the curvature of your particle. So, Will the energy for bowing change if all we do is we keep the particle size the same, but we change essentially the uh, the volume fraction? No, right? Because again, it just depends on we are going to kind of encircle or ensnare every single you know. So here's my little particle. It doesn't you know? We're just going to encircle each one. We're going to butt off and encircle that with our dislocation. Now, what about cutting? So cutting again, it depends on the amount of surface area that we're going to create, right? So the particle sizes are the same. I agree with that. But the, what's the total amount of surface area that we create here? Well, it's the particle size. That's a, big, that's a contributor. But if we increase the number or the volume fraction of particles, we're creating more surface area overall, right? Because we're cutting through this particle, this particle, this particle, this particle, this particle, all of those particles. Here, we're only cutting through a couple of these, of these particles here. So the total amount of surface area that you create here versus here when you're cutting is going to be much, much different. You're going to create way more surface area over here. So your R critical is going to shift. It is going to be, the R critical one is going to be much greater than the R critical of two because we don't want to cut. We're, it's going to be smaller and smaller and smaller particles. It is going to kind of shift this way. So as the volume fraction of particles or precipitates increases, the critical radius for cutting versus bowing will decrease because you're cutting even more particles, which creates more surface area and an even larger energy penalty. That's kind of the key aspect um, that you can see. I'm going to kind of go back to our lecture notes again. 
always please read the next lecture notes. Um, it is explained, you know, this paragraph here is critical when you're understanding uh, cutting versus bowing. So keep that in mind. I love problems like this. Again, kind of these thought experiments in terms of, you know, strengthening and strengthening mechanisms. I'm going to throw a bunch of different parameters out there. Remember, you're scaling. So for work hardening, we saw that our change in yield stress was proportional to dislocation density to the half. For solute strengthening, uh, change in yield stress is proportional to C solute to the half. For our uh, grain size, so our hall pitch, we saw that change in yield stress was proportional to DG to the minus one. And uh, again, we don't, you know, you kind of want to have this idea of when do we bow, when do we cut this diagram, and how will this R crit shift? So where will all RC go depending on as we change, you know, kind of different parameters? So the volume fraction, the size of particles, when do we cut, when do we, you know, uh, bow around? That is kind of critical here. Um, just to kind of finish up, uh, you know me, I love polymers, so I can't stop uh, talking about polymers. And specifically, polymers will give you some really kind of interesting, um, basically yielding mechanisms. So we've been talking a lot about like dislocation motion, yielding, not just, I said dislocations, my chair is squeaking, uh, but I mean yielding mechanisms. So for the different yielding mechanisms, uh, polymers can exhibit some uh, kind of really cool phenomena. One of them is uh, basically they can either undergo shear banding or crazing. So shear banding is basically this, uh, you'll see as you pull your polymer, especially if it's transparent, you'll see kind of these like lines form at 45 degree angles. So why, and it's, this is called shear banding, why are they forming at these 45 degree angles? Well, we know if we're under this stress state, right? So if my stress state is this, so if my system is one, two, if I just have sigma one, one, and everything else is zero, uniaxial tensile testing, if I'm looking at this one, two plane, and if I draw more circle, I know that I have some stress at sigma one, one, I have zero here, I'm already in my principal stress state. If I want to rotate to my maximum normal, or my maximal shear stress state, I'm going to do a two theta of 90 degrees, but in real space, not in my more circle space. My theta is 45 degrees. So you'll see the shear banding occur at regions or at orientations where shear is maximized. Conversely, at crazing, you'll see here that rotation. What's this rotation here? It's zero, right? But or you know, it's, or it's 180, depending on you know, how you want to define it. But uh, you'll see for crazing, you'll see basically these kind of little like um, if you zoom in here, these are like nanometer like length scale. Like you'll see these kind of almost little like micro voids. Uh, start to form, and these little fibrils will span this region here. So it's a really kind of, uh, you know, amazing phenomenon. There's lots of kind of cool polymer physics that go into, like, how, you know, the surface area that's created in this craze and how those fibrils, how long can they stretch? It depends on polymer dynamics and kind of the chemical structure of your polymer and this kind of idea of conformational entropy versus kind of surface area. Again, um, you could kind of read my MEP202 notes or take my class uh, if you want to learn more about that. But uh, I just want to kind of introduce this idea that, you know, there's more yielding mechanisms than kind of just what we've been talking about uh, here. So uh, I really hope, uh, you know, if you're interested, please let me know. I'll be happy to kind of talk to you and provide some notes uh, on that. But, yeah, that's it for kind of, um, you know, our kind of typical yielding mechanisms that you'll see. Uh, next time we're going to get into time, temperature dependent, uh, plasticity, and specifically creep. Um, so there's kind of these three different uh, kind of creep regimes. We're going to look at deformation mechanism maps, and then we'll finally get into our last section of mechanics, which is uh, fracture. So fun stuff when you start to break things. So that's it. All right. Uh, let me know if you have any other questions, and thanks. Bye.